Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started here at today's SciLab seminar. Welcome to our new location in Hamburg Hall. First time we're trying this out. And my name is Michael Asaki. I'm the director of partnerships for SciLab. This is SciLab seminar, and I'm pleased today to introduce Professor Kathleen Carley. And Kathleen is a professor of societal computing and the Institute of Software Research here at Carnegie Mellon. She is the director of the Center for Computational Analysis of Social and Organizational Systems, or CASOS, as well as the director of the Center for Informed Democracy and Social Cybersecurity, or IDEAS, mm -hmm. a brand new center here on campus, and the CEO of Net Anonymous. Kathleen's research interests include applying computational social science, cognitive science, organizational science, dynamic network analysis, social network analysis, machine learning, data analytics, and the text analytics to complex social and organizational problems, such as social cybersecurity, disinformation, disease contagion, disaster response, and terrorism. So with that, please join me in welcoming Kathleen for her talk today. So thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone, for being here. What I'm going to talk to you about are influence operations, which are the uh, techniques and activities that are being used to shape people's opinions, shape their beliefs, shape what they do, particularly as carried out through social media. In doing that, I'm also going to define for you what this new area of social cybersecurity is like, what is involved with it, and uh, link that into with a little bit of information at the very end on what the New Ideas Center is about. So let me start by taking you to a movie. The movie is The Black Panther. The Black Panther is a really cool movie, especially if you like science fiction and Marvel movies. But we decided to actually study this movie, not to study the movie itself, but the response to it in social media. Given that this is the United States, this is just the kind of movie that will evoke response and that would lead to disinformation occurring. And what we have is the first ever trace of disinformation campaigns where the entire campaign, the entire influence campaign, every single uh, mention that occurred in social media occurred. I'm going to focus here on just what occurred in uh, Twitter. Now, what was there were in fact disinformation campaigns around this movie. There were in fact four of them. The biggest one uh, was actually associated with the, this particular uh, campaign. And what this one was trying to do was say, don't go to this movie if you're a white man because you'll get beaten up. All of the messages were the form, I went to this movie, my cousin went, my uncle went, my brother went, and I got beaten up and they had these pictures. Not a single event like this actually occurred. Uh, the pictures have nothing to do with movie theaters for the most part. You know, a lot of them aren't even true scenes of people getting beaten up. Like one has a guy with ketchup on his face, but this one's Spike. Now what most people will tell you is that when disinformation campaigns occur, that the influence operations behind them are such that they will go on, they will get out there into the world, and they will persist for extremely long times. In point of fact, that's wrong. Most of these influence campaigns die a very quick death, with a half-life being around two days. Around the Black Panther movie, there were in fact four disinformation campaigns. Uh, one of the influence campaigns was one I just mentioned, which is that I got beaten up. There was a satire version of that. There was another one about fake scenes where they made up these scenes and said they had occurred in the movie. Usually they were scenes from Batman movies. And then the, the fourth one was a, um, was trying to convince people that in fact the Black Panther was an alt-right movie, which it clearly was not. Okay, now what they were doing in this, in all of these ones, like I said, they all died a very quick uh, death, except for the alt-right one. And what our studies have shown, and what our research shows in general, is that if there's an offline group and an online group, that influence campaigns that, that go into the online version of it actually last longer, are harder to break up, and are harder to stop if there's an offline group associated with it. So in this particular case, uh, that, was, that was in fact the case, and we see that again and again and again in everything from not just movies, to, but to things related to, for example, election manipulation or um, things related to um, d uh, human trafficking and drug use. Now, there's also this one thing that happened in this particular campaign, and that is that how, did, how in fact did that campaign shut down? 
So the I Got Beaten Up one was actually completely shut down extremely rapidly through a participatory democracy approach where other people started sending out counter, a counter-influence campaign that had the same byline, I went to the movie and I got beaten up, or my friend went and got beaten up. But it, they were all satirical. And so the use of satire both exploded and was much more effective, but it also cut, stopped the other one, that and calling out the original, uh, the original thing. What were those ones that they were talking about? Well, I went and got beaten up, but I look like SpongeBob, okay? Or I'm Hulk Hogan, okay? Now, here's where the Post and the New York Times got involved. At this point, they said, oh my gosh, there's disinformation influence campaign around this movie you know, and speculating on where it came from. But what they pointed out to the American public was that this guy here, Two-Face, was actually a scene from a movie because a lot of people thought he was real. So newspapers were good at increasing credibility in this particular case. Now, why did, these go, why did this happen and what was going on and why was the alt-right so different? Partly because there was no community. What we found in social media in general is that influence campaigns are more effective when there is an existing community. In this case, there was no community. The community grew around the disinformation and grew and grew, but it also was a community of two parts. Those who are spreading the true, the, uh, the disinformation that was really wrong, that I got beaten up and I'm a white guy, versus the ones that were satirical, I got beaten up and I'm SpongeBob. And those two groups started counteracting and fighting against each other. And they formed a very pop-up community, and then it died. Okay, very rapidly. What was the role of bots? Actually, some of this stuff actually started, and many disinformation influence campaigns start, in blogs. They move out into Twitter for amplification. They move into Facebook for a little bit of additional amplification. Then they go into YouTube, and in YouTube they get bring in you know, videos and have more fact, more influence, and then they go back into the blogs. This was happening here, and bots were simply used not to start this story, but to further spread it and further amplify it. Now, in the case of the Black Panther, that's, you might go, well, that's okay, but that's kind of silly. I mean, really, who cares about movies? They're just Marvel, you know. We all know there's people out there who don't like Marvel movies or Disney. Okay, and that's true. But the same exact tactics have been used in natural disasters. Now, it's not so bad when people are sending out messages like this one, which is there's planes underwater in Houston. That did not occur. Or the megastorm picture up there. Okay, those so pictures like that and the stories around them tend to occur in every single natural disaster that has, in the case of the megastorm, high winds, or in the case of the water, one that involves water. Okay, all they do is they Photoshop in whatever the image is of the week. So if it's in Paris, it's going to be the Eiffel Tower. If it's in India, it's going to be the Taj Mahal, etc. These stories go out there. They're gone in two days. They are not a problem. Okay. These are not, but they use the same techniques. What's more important and what's more influential are the stories that are around and the disinformation campaigns that are around things like this. This was a fake number to call if you had problems after a disaster, such as you couldn't find your loved ones or if you needed uh, food, water, etc. What they would do is people would get this message, they would call that number, they would find out that you had missing kids, and they would go look for those kids and engage them in human trafficking much more serious effect. This one was also, again, uh, affected, came, came out of blogs and was amplified in Twitter and YouTube. This one, on the other hand, was done originally as a joke. Okay, not all of this is done with, by a terror group or an intentionally done. That one was done as a joke. It was a bunch of kids who went to the Manchester United game and afterwards they thought, wouldn't it be fun to just send out a post that's saying our little brother's lost? So they sent out a post saying, oh, help, help, we can't find our little brother. He was lost when we went to this game. Now, that actually led to a massive manhunt for that kid. Where's the false information and what was wrong about this as an influence campaign? This picture. That kid was actually a poster child for autism. Okay, that kid at the time that post was sent out was actually an adult. This was not a real thing. That was again posted by kids just for fun, but it spread like wildfire. And it was picked up and repeated over and over again. And one of the reasons it got, got such play in the play was because it was repeated by celebrities and real news agencies who did not go and check the facts behind it. 
So one another thing our work is showing is that, in fact, influence campaigns can be more effective when you capture the attention of people who themselves uh, are uh, super spreaders in the space. And of course, these can have tragic consequences, as in the case of Pizzagate. <clears throat> So we also found that the spread of influence campaigns and social media have other kinds of interesting consequences. OK, this one got messed up. Um, one consequence, of course, is that it can lead to things like mass shootings, like in the Pizzagate case. But it also can lead to other kinds of interesting effects. For example, influence campaigns that are aimed against a country. So let's say I send out, I run this campaign that basically says, you know, Russia's really terrible, or China's really terrible, or pick your favorite country, they're really terrible. And I spend out a lot of messages like that across multiple media, okay? And I might even orchestrate it, so again, it goes through Twitter, YouTube, Reddit, et cetera. As those campaigns come out, they are frequently much more than you would expect, followed by actual cyber attacks on those countries, okay? So there are consequences of these things. You can't just say, I don't care because I don't do Twitter. I don't care because I don't do Facebook. In point of fact, you're connected to someone who does. You're connected to many people who does. And because of that, you're actually getting influence in ways you may not even realize it. So what is social cybersecurity? Social cybersecurity has been recognized by the National Academies and by the National Science Foundation as a new emergent science. It is actually the uh, science itself to characterize, understand, and forecast cyber-mediated changes in human behavior, at, as well as social changes, political changes, et cetera. But it's also an engineering or applied field. So it's actually the technologies you want to develop in this area so that society can continue to persist in its essential form without undue influence. So where we think of, and what I would like to think about it, is that cybersecurity, OK, is actually here talking about hacking machines and data. Social cybersecurity is actually aimed at hacking people. So if there's a fine line between two of these. There's a whole drawn out chapter in a National Academy's decadal survey of the area. But this is kind of a new emerging science. Now, as a science, it actually lies. It's a computational social science, meaning it involves computer science applied to social problems and social science done with com computational techniques. It also is related to media and marketing, and it's also related to policy and law. And it's right at the sweet spot between those. Most of the research in here is actually inventing new theories, because what we found is a lot of the traditional theories, whether they come from psychology or economics or anthropology or whatever, are not working when you go to a cyber media environment at scale like we have in the, with new digital trace data. So it's, so it's actually kind of a multidisciplinary, if not transdisciplinary area. It's also a multi-methodological area. And the area itself has hundreds of people, thousands of people working in it, and it has just exploded in terms of the number of papers that are in it. And that has continued to grow over the past two years and so on. So it's a very much a growing area of research and concern. The, but the people in this area are publishing all over the map. A lot of the work in this area you will find in books. Some you will find in book chapters. There is no one conference that currently you know, is the conference one goes to in this area. There are three different ones that are kind of all vying for first place. So the paper stuff is all over the place. A lot of the stuff is a one-off paper in one journal that never sees another paper in the area. The areas of research in this include things like, uh, things like social science, communications, you know, computer science, artificial intelligence, et cetera. All these different areas are linked. But the big ones are, the, are again, social science, communications, and artificial intelligence. Within that, the sub area of social networks and machine learning and natural language processing are key. Now, this is a set of people who work in that area. This is the co-authorship network. And so everybody who's in there is someone who's written a paper in this space. And they're linked to, OK, they're the dots. And the links between them are, did they write a paper together? When I first started collecting data on this area for the National Academy, I would go to people and say, hey, who all works in this area? And they would say, no one, just me and my students. Okay, That's because they were in these kind of groups like this 
where this is them and their students, this is them and their students. Okay, it was only after a while, okay, that people started to realize there were more than that. So if I go to someone now, they say, yes, yeah, Kathleen, we know there's a lot of people in the area. Okay, but I don't know them, <laughs> okay. But it, it's a big, important area. The stuff you're seeing there in green and red is actually the core uh, here at Carnegie Mellon in this area. Okay, so we actually, and this is one of the reasons that we actually decided to start the Idea Center. These are some of the big uh, authors who've written a lot of stuff in the area with Northwestern, ASU, ASU, Carnegie Mellon, and Indiana being at the very core. So how is, this, how is the group in here, and what are they looking at from a social cybersecurity perspective? Much of the stuff is on disinformation, not all. A bunch of the rest is on insider threat and phishing. Uh, but from an influence campaign perspective, which is what the focus is today, we're, going to talk, we're talking more about the stuff related to disinformation. Traditionally, when people talk about influence campaigns, uh, even before the term social cybersecurity started being used, um, people talked about disinformation. They talked about the four Ds of influence campaigns. The four Ds actually came out of some studies about Russia and studies of what was Russia doing to the U.S. Largely, these were Cold War type studies. And the four Ds were dismay, distract, distort, um, and uh, just and dismiss. These were the way people would understand social media. And as recently as 2018, these four Ds are the way in which governments, uh, industries working for the governments, newspapers who would report on those things would talk about influence operations, okay? And this was NATO's Trident Juncture 2018, where all they could talk about were the four Ds. In point of fact, if you actually look at influence campaigns in social media, you find that there are that it is half about affecting the narrative. What are people talking about? Okay, so this is changing what is being posted, how many posts are occurring, the content of those posts, etc. The other half of what's going on is affecting who is talking to whom. It's affecting the community. It's affecting who is the opinion leader, changing who which groups are actually meeting, and so on. So there's both community effects and narrative effects. And one of the things we know from organization science is that if you want to change an organization or a group, if you want to change a community, you can't just change what they're talking about. You also have to change who is talking to whom. And right now, in, in all the influence campaigns that are being successful are, are actually doing that. They're doing both, and they're doing it very effectively. And we'll see some examples. <clears throat> Now, in conducting an influence campaign, there's a lot of tools that are being used. Many of these are uh, derived from artificial intelligence, but some of the others are just like things we would think of as part of our normal everyday life, like the use of videos and images. Um, bots, of course, are extremely common. Bots being just a piece of software that can do things very fast. Cyborgs being a bot with a human connected to each other. Trolls, which are actually humans, that they are acting to disrupt groups under a fake persona and uh, usually using abusive language and disruptive tactics, often passive aggressive tactics. Deep fakes being another one part of this space. Um, things that involve memes, which are images with statements in them, and so on. Those are the tools and techniques that are currently being used. More kind of techniques are coming out all the time, but these are the tools right now that are uh, being used to conduct these influence campaigns. These uh, ca campaigns are being conducted using those tools to again find it, uh, to affect what you and I think to, to the extent possible and what we actually do. So we've developed a methodology um, in our group to actually try to capture what's going on on influence campaigns and to counter, develop countermeasures. The first part of that is to understand how the internet is organized for communication. And it's organized around these things we call topic groups. A topic group is a group of actors who talk to each other about more or less the same things. Uh, once you find the topic groups, you then have to find the key actors within it and the key narratives. Once you do that, you have to identify the information maneuvers. That's where Bend comes in, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, and then once you do that, you need to analyze this at two levels. What is it doing to the individuals? What is it doing to the groups? Because there's always these two-level impacts, just as there are short-term and long-term impacts of any influence campaign. 
So the thing about social media to keep in mind is it doesn't matter what you're talking about. It doesn't matter if you're talking about GitHub as a social media or Twitter or Reddit or Facebook or, or, any, or any of the other, or WhatsApp or whatever. Each one of them, there will be individuals act, operating on it, there will be organizations operating on it, and there will be bots. And the thing about it, from a cognitive perspective, your brain can't tell the difference. And you might be able to say, oh, I think that's a bot. OK, but four days later, if someone says, where did you get that information from? It's like, well, I got it from social media. You won't know, remember that you got it from a bot versus a human versus an organization. So what are these bots and these trolls and so on doing? Well, they're doing three things. One is they're exploiting the technologies. Almost every single influence campaign we've seen out there that was effective exploited some feature of, these, of the various uh, social media technologies. The most frequent thing they, they uh, exploit is the prioritization schemes. They design their structures, they design the way, with their messages so that their messages and they themselves as actors will get prioritized and get recommended to you. The second thing that they tend to, ex they tend to exploit is the scroll down technology itself, making sure that messages and, and activities are timed so the stuff always occurs at the top of your scroll down feed. Recognizing that one of the things that all humans have in common, regardless of culture, is that we're inherently lazy and no one ever scrolls down to the end of a scroll down feed, okay? Um, the other thing uh, that they will do is they will repurpose old accounts or they will take over accounts. And there's a variety of ways they do, it, do that, including asking you if you want to buy their service to repost your message. And there's a little clause in the, some of these that say, and we reserve the right to message from your account, meaning they can send whatever they want, and they do. Um, the other thing that these things exploit is features about our, the way our brains work, particularly our cognitive biases. These are well-known cognitive biases that have been found in behavioral decision theory and in psychology, things like uh, confirmation bias, things like how people respond to intimidation, et cetera. But, even more importantly, is that they also exploit something called social cognition, which is less well studied. And social cognition are the heuristics that our brain that we use, that our brain uses, to make sense of vast, vast, vast quantities of data at the group level, in terms of groups. So it's things like our, stereotype, our automatic stereotyping function, our ability to infer information about the general from the particular, so you meet someone new, and they're in a group you've never heard of, and automatically you assume everybody else in that group is like that person. Okay, so it's gonna, it's like stereotyping, it's the opposite cognitively. And they also exploit something called the generalized other. So how many of you have been in a room where someone has said, oh, well, everybody knows? Right, Every, everyone, right? Have you ever asked the three people, who is everybody? They have no clue, okay? It's just, well, you know, everybody, okay? The, that everybody is what is meant by the generalized other. It's a term coming out of anthropology that refers to our sense in our brain of what the group thinks, okay, or what a group thinks is the generalized other. And one of the things that is going on in influence campaigns is that they're using these technologies like bots, cyborgs, and trolls to create the appearance of a group when there is not, to create the appearance that everybody knows something so that individuals will, will pay attention to it. Because if you know that everybody knows something, you're more likely to go along with it. And this was what underlied a lot of the influence campaigns in the 2016 elections up to, I mean, and it's still going on, and we saw them in the 2018 elections. We've seen them in every election throughout the world in the past uh, couple years. <clears throat> so what are some of the key ideas you need to understand this space? <clears throat> One of the key ideas you need to know about is a super spreader. Now, a super spreader is an individual or an actor who has the disproportionate ability to get their message out. That doesn't mean that people agree with it. It doesn't mean they like the person. It just means their message will somehow get into your feed. Okay. So super spreaders are very important in this place because that's how you get them. Because you can't agree with something until you at least read it. Um, the next idea is a super friend. 
A super friend is actually not a member of the superheroes club, but is actually an individual who is engaged in a high number of reciprocal relationships. Meaning, I talk to you, you talk to me. I tweet you, you retweet me. I friend you, you friend me. Some kind of reciprocal relationships. It turns out that in social media, while super spreaders get messages out, super friends are very instrumental in shaping groups, shaping discussions, and convincing groups to go and act in a certain way. The third idea you need to know about is the echo chamber. And the echo chamber is a topic group on steroids. It's a group of individuals who are talking almost exclusively to each other and almost exclusively about a single topic. They, they form very quickly. Once they form, they will act totally emotionally, but then they will often break apart. Okay, but echo chambers are this kind of pathological form. In network imaging, uh, this is the network picture showing you that the super friend has lots of arrows going out to other people the super friend two-way relationships, and the echo chamber is a bunch of individuals who are all connected to all. This is very important because you as an individual, when you're looking at in the messages that you're getting, don't know what the network around them looks like and don't know if you're talking to an individual who you just happen to be friends with or if that person is also part of an echo chamber. You don't know about the connections usually among your, among your friends' friends. So social media, again, it's, every social media is focused around topic groups, groups of individuals or actors who are more or less talking together, more or less talking about the same things. These are where organizations are the E. coli for organization theory. Topic groups are the E. coli for anyone interested in communication. These things come and go, come and go. Some of them have very long-standing uh, relationships, such as plane spotters which are people who go and look at planes and then say what kind it is and post it to everybody else. Some of them are very ephemeral, like, uh, and some of them are periodic, like the one around the World Cup, World Cup soccer. Okay? Um, but a pathological form, like I said, is the echo chamber. In terms of the science of this, four years ago we did not have measures of these things that were stable, robust, and scalable. Nowadays we do. This is what an echo chamber is like. <coughs> The trouble with echo chambers is that once they form and when they're, in their, when they're, th when they're at their height, the individuals who are members of them uh, start to lose objectivity. They start to communicate more in anecdotes rather than in facts. They uh, tend to circle the wagons and not let in outsiders. They tend to be hostile to any argument that doesn't come from within. Any idea that gets within them spreads to everyone in the group extremely fast. And they are very easy to heighten the emotions of the individuals in these groups. If you can form an echo chamber, you can take it into a form of amygdala hijack. That is, once you've got it in, people into this echo chamber, you can take them over emotionally and get them to respond to the world emotionally rather than rationally. And so one of the things that's going on in influence campaigns is you're trying to build and create echo chambers temporarily, heighten the emotions within them in order to get people to respond in this, in this irrational or emotional way. And one of the ways you do that is with memes. Memes are all over the place. This is just simply showing you that there's lots of different uh, images out there that we use in our media. But of those, you know, fully uh, somewhere between uh, one quarter to 50% of them, depending on which country and which time of year it is, tend to be memes. These happen to be memes that were all spread during the American 2018 elections. Memes are actually very critical and are spread and are used within these to affect emotions because people get more emotional from looking at images than from words. <clears throat> but they're also used as a way of carrying nuanced political debate. So for example, these again, this is from the 2018 elections. What you're seeing there is the red dot indicates it's Republican, the blue dot indicates it's Democrat. And what you can see is sometimes as the memes are evolving, they stay within one storyline. And sometimes they were switching back and forth. And the ones that are switching back and forth, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, et cetera, were actually being used to counter a debate, were carried by bots on both sides, and were actually very influential in creating these uh, topic groups that became echo chambers. So how do we study that? We study these things now with this approach called BEND. The term BEND just simply stands for, I've got four Bs, four Es, four Ns, four Ds or different kinds of information maneuvers. 
These are the information maneuvers. They are used to affect two things. There's eight of them that actually affect the narrative and there's that, or counter narrative and the eight that affect the community or, or the allies and adversaries in the group. So the Ben framework says, look, we've got an influence campaign. First, I want to know who's conducting it. I don't want to know that it's Andy, okay? What I want to know is that is the kind of actor. Is it a bot? Is it a cyborg? Is it a news agency? Is it a government actor? Is it an organization or group that's doing it? So that's the first part. Technologies now exist for finding out those things. The next thing you want to know is what are the maneuvers that they're doing? Which of those uh, 16 bend items are they doing? Are they building a group, bridging a group? Are they nuking a group? Are they uh, creating excitement or dismay? Then you want to know who are they affecting? Okay, are, is this aimed at an individual or is this aimed at a group? And then finally, you want to know about impact. Now, there's lots of social media and tools out there, okay? Tons of them. And some of them are free. Most of them are very expensive. But all of them measure impact using what are called vanity metrics. How many times was your message repeated? How many times were you liked? How many times um, was this retweeted? Okay, those are not good measures of impact. What we're looking at here are measures of impact, such as did this actually create increased echo chamberness? Did this create mass hysteria? Okay, things like that. So one of the scientific issues in this field at the moment is identifying new improved measures of impact that go beyond the vanity metrics. So we wanna go from these 16 band maneuvers to uh, measuring their impact. Now let me talk a little bit more about these band maneuvers. We have positive and negative ones, and we have positive and negative community ones, positive and negative uh, narrative ones. Why? Because when we looked at the four Ds, which were developed originally, and then looked at what was really happening during elections and disasters and so on, we found that spreading of narratives that were positive, caused to excite people, were as or more effective. And we also found that in, in many cases, what they were doing was they were actually affecting the community. So let's look at these in a little more detail. Uh, first, I'm gonna look at the narrative ones, okay? So these are, again, on the negative side, uh, being a, the, the four Ds, okay? But on the positive side, there's the four Es, which is to engage or excite or enhance or to explain something. And I'm gonna show you some examples of a few of these. Okay, these are happened to be from Triton Juncture 2018, which was a large NATO uh, live ammo exercise. And NATO sent out the picture on your left. This was the Viking Warrior Influence Campaign. The point of the public affairs officers is always to try to convince people that NATO is good, NATO is great, it's strong, it will support you, you should like NATO. And I wanna point out that there's more stuff on the so, on the, in social media about nuclear weapons than there is about NATO, okay? just for context. This is the impact that it had, okay? It measured the way they traditionally measure impact, which is how many people like this, how many different media platforms did it go into. So the Viking warrior story actually got a lot of play from a NATO perspective, okay? It sent the image and the view. Uh, it was meant to create excitement that, you know, NATO is strong, it's filled with these young, gorgeous guys, et cetera, and you can trust us, okay? On the other hand, Russia said, Okay, we're gonna do something else. They put out this double meme. The double meme at the top has the uh, defense ministers of Norway and Sweden and so on. Okay, at the bottom is the defense minister of Russia. The, mess the hidden message, of course, is, you know, Europe, you don't stand a chance. You know, you're, you don't understand the military. You know, you've got women in charge, they're weak, you know, et cetera, whereas we really understand the military, we, you know, we'll be better able to defend you because we get it, okay? And it had huge play. So by NATO's standards, okay, vanity metrics, NATO lost. This was way less expensive to do the meme than was that. So by economic standards, NATO lost. Okay, this was a hugely effective dismay campaign that had a lot of play and got a lot of the for members of the former Soviet Union countries very upset and very worried that NATO was not going to be able to support them even though they were now in NATO. And of course, they extended it. They extended it and enhanced it with another campaign by bringing in more people. And this meme as it evolved was kept adding more and more and more enhancements. And it was a very effective influence campaign. 
So I've shown you is two things. One, I've shown you dismay and excite campaigns. Secondly, I've shown you that we can build more complex campaigns by building on these in terms of these maneuvers. Here's a couple of others. This is an enhanced campaign on the left, dismiss one on the right. The dismiss one is meant to belittle. In this case, again, they were using a meme. The meme basically says, you know, oh, Syria is being attacked. Let's help them out by attacking them too thereby making fun of the United States and their involvement in that part of the world. The enhanced campaign was more complex. In the enhanced campaign, what Russia today was doing was sending out a message basically saying that <clears throat> Israel's Iron Dorm uh, defense was, going to, was a failure. Russia's uh, systems actually work, and here's why. Now, what they're doing is they're sending out a dismay campaign. Okay, Israel is failing. To the members who are part of the Russian side, they're sending out an excite campaign, but ours work, okay? So it's an enhancement, and they are also doing an explanation. Here is why. And this then points to a, this longer set of articles, okay, a set of URLs, so longer set of articles, explaining how that system actually works, and so on. So this was actually a very positive, a very positive campaign. But now let's look at the people side. Because the narrative side, I think, is easy to get and easy to understand. But when you're talking about the people's side of who's connected to whom, most people don't keep social network images and, and then metrics in their head. So you don't necessarily understand, so people don't always get this. I'm going to describe some uh, campaigns aimed, he, aimed here. In particular, I'm going to talk about build campaigns to build groups where none existed, and a new campaign to actually take down and make a particular group look ineffective. <clears throat> Here are the two campaigns. On your left is a build campaign. This took place during Euromaidan. We actually were able to find it and watch it as it was growing. And what was happening was there were a set of young guys in the Ukraine, did not know each other at all, okay? As far as we could tell, they had no prior interactions, but they did have something they liked to do. They liked to send out light pornographic pictures of women. So this bot so now enters the Euromedon bot. And what this bot started doing was it started messaging out Im things saying, Joe and Mark, here's another image you might like. Now what, twi what this did was it was, since it was a social influence bot all, that all talked to each other, it automatically was captured by Twitter and it was automatically viewed as anything coming from what was important. It would mention these two guys now, all of a sudden, anything from that bot would get prioritized in those two guys' feeds, and the two guys saw about each other. And it did this for pair by pair, or triad by triad, of all the guys in this group. And what the guys would do is they then would say, oh, here's someone else who likes the same kind of image as I do. And they would start following them as well. And before long, you had a group of young men, all of whom liked to share these images, all of whom were following each other. This was now a big group. And now anything from any super spreader in the group would go to any other member of that group. And once that was done, then what the uh, bot did was it started tweeting out about how to get involved in the revolution, where to go get guns, uh, where to go get training if you needed it, and how to basically engage in the Ukrainian-Russian uh, thing. So this actually was very effective in recruiting soldiers into Crimea for the Russians. Um, so the new campaign, um, we like to call this a denial of service in Twitter sphere. Um, what's, what they're doing is they're actually blanking out all of Finland with tweets. If you're capturing data from that, from that geolocation, and when you capture data, unless you have the full, full set of data, you'll capture stuff at the top of the hour. Because this is going so fast, blacking that out, all that you'll get are, are these tweets. They'll be coming in at the top of the hour. What is it doing? Well, it turns out it was, the, it was meant to be innocuous. It was this guy who absolutely loves Finnish numbers, okay? This guy just loves Finnish numbers, thinks they're beautiful. And so I thought, wouldn't it be fun to show my love for Finnish numbers to Finland by simply spreading out one Finnish number per, you know, nanosecond, okay, and just counting. It's literally just counting, okay, going up and down over and over and over again. But it's doing it so fast, it's blacking out everything else. So that was an effective new campaign, even though it wasn't intended to. Now, when MIT did the same thing to Harvard during a football game by writing MIT over the effective Twitter sphere over the Harvard football stadium, that was intentional. Okay, but, okay. Here's an example of another campaign that is actually a neutralization one that was hiding as a backing campaign. 
This is one that we found because we were tracking all the events that were occurring in the Middle East. This was in, in Yemen. Uh, Iona Craig is actually a journalist. She's an Irish journalist. She's known for trying to get out the information about what is going on in Yemen. All of a sudden, the number of accounts on her escalated. These are the accounts following her. Went from a few to just very, 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 very rapidly. If you actually scroll down and start looking at these accounts, a lot of them look like sock puppets. You saw those kind of images you see there. They don't look like anything. Uh, but if you keep scrolling down further, the images get increasingly lewd and obnoxious. Uh, what they're trying to do is if you can actually get your account can get banned if too many of your followers have lewd pictures. Uh, the other thing that they were trying to do is they were just trying to make it look like she's associated with these. So, what, so she decided, look, I want to get these things banned because I just don't want them on my page. So she, it takes more effort and more time to convince any of the social media platforms to ban an account or to remove an account or to suspend an account than it does to build and create a new bot to do the stuff. She found she was spending so much time doing that she couldn't get out the news, so she decided to quit and just write the news anyway, and so on. But it, this was an attempt attempting to, to actually neutralize this woman and keep her from sending out the news, and it worked for a small period of time. Now, those are all kind of one-off examples. I'm going to give you another example here of a complex campaign that was run, that it was run during the 2016 elections, 2018, every single election in Western Europe. But this one actually isn't an election. This is called the polarization campaign. This is very, very standard. What you do is you find two groups who are naturally in opposition. In this case, it was the pro-NATO, the anti-NATO group. And you infiltrate both sides with your bots and your trolls. So here we have the pro-group and the an anti-group. The pro-group, in this case, sent out a message saying, hey, we're going to NATO for three different exercises this year. It was one of these wave the flags, everything's great things. That was actually sent out by Germany, who was the lead on the exercise, and everything, and everything looked fine. NATO was capturing the information, and they said, oh, that message is getting a lot of play in the media. Lots of people are rebroadcasting it. They're putting it onto their media. They're retweeting it. They're putting it on Facebook. It's great. Very good message. We've got a good, lot of play. Remember, it's a vanity metric. On the other side of the coin, RT Today and Sputnik sent out another message that basically said, Germany may be going to NATO, but they're going to not do very well because they don't have the money to buy this piece of equipment they need because NATO costs too much. That was a dismay campaign. So on the one hand, we've got an excite campaign, and on the other hand, a dismay campaign. On the dismay side, that one got almost as much play as the Excite campaign did. But everyone just missed it because saying, well, it doesn't matter. That was, came from Russia today. Who cares? But the story's better because who was actually retweeting and rebroadcasting and liking all those messages? On the case of the pro-NATO one, the Excite campaign, it was not getting enough play from members of NATO. Instead, Russia was the one who was resending it and sending back out messages. Okay, Russia started using trolls and bots to just rebroadcast that message over and over again to make sure that the positive NATO message stayed in play. Because at the same time, they were building connections among the member of the group and trying to make it more and more of an echo chamber. On the other side, okay, the al you know, any of the allies, members of Germany, members of the US, et cetera, were posting out things about NATO costing too much. And they were also managing to build connections and so on. So now you have these two groups that pre-existed that in social media became increasingly echo chamber-like. One was getting, was getting their amygdala hijacked by excitement, the other one by dismay, to the point where these groups actually had a protest in Germany over this issue. Okay, why does this kind of thing work? It works in general, we have found, because on the one side you have um, a dismay campaign going on, on the other side you have an excite campaign. That are the things you need to uh, you know, um, hijack the amygdala, but at the same time, you have to have a boosting and backing campaign going on to actually boost up certain individuals in the group, back certain members of the group, and build ties so that the groups as a whole whole become much more dense, much more of an echo chamber. So you have to do both, and when you do that, you can actually get this polarization effect. Every single campaign, every single election throughout Western Europe, things like this were going on. And they were always aimed, at, and in the US, they were always aimed at anti-women, the anti-feminist group, 
anti-LGBTQT, uh, and they were also aimed at ethnic minorities and religious minorities, every single one of these. Okay, here's another social influence campaign, just to give you an example of how crazy these things can get. This is one we were able to track through time uh, related to ISIS. Well, we started off saying, can we even identify members of ISIS in social media? Turns out it's pretty hard. But we had four members of ISIS. We went through this convoluted process. Um, it, there was this convoluted statistical graph approach. And eventually we found the members of the group. And that's this big green and blue thing here, as well as two little sub um, satellites. And within each of those groups, we then ran various clustering algorithms. And you can see there's three groups. We ran various language algorithms. We see that there's the same three groups. And then what you're seeing there is the ones that are blue. Those are the ones that are accounts that are suspended. If you wanted to go back and repeat our analysis, you can't. The accounts don't exist. The data doesn't exist. And we're not allowed to share it with you. It's very frustrating in this field. But anyway, the accounts that are suspended are the ones that Anonymous claimed were members of ISIS. I will tell you that this group here on the top right speaks basically only, or writes only in uh, English romance letters. This group writes mainly in English with a little bit of Arabic. It's usually English, 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 inshallah. And this group only writes in Arabic. What this graph shows you in part is anonymous and Twitter at this point in time could not speak Arabic. Okay, now there's the fear of being known bot. The fear of being known bot looks like this little thing in the middle. It forms an echo chamber. It does that by each of the bots mention each other. Once you've got an echo chamber there, that prior Twitter says, oh, I see there's a group. I'm going to take that group and pay attention to it. So now it's paying attention to this bot chamber. Okay, now the, what happens is those bot algorithms go out and they start retweeting messages by the imam in the top right group. The imam doesn't even have to know what's going on. He's a super spreader in the group. And Twitter then says, oh, you're uh, rebroadcasting messages from a super spreader. I'm going to prioritize your messages to all the members of the group. So now that bot's messages, which were generally retweets of the imam, all went to all the members of the group. Once that happened, the bot then started tweeting about this site up here. Uh, and now the message about that site got prioritized to all the members of the group. And then members of the group started following and going to that site. What is the site? The site was a um, thing that, where you went. It was a charity collecting money for the children of Syria, thought to be a money laundering site for ISIS. From the case of the Bend approach, this involved a, a very complex overtime strategy of building, then backing, then bridging, then creating dismay, and then backing again. So by using these band influ information maneuvers, which we're trying to operationalize, we can begin to put in place and understand complex influence campaigns and how they play out. By looking at these in conjunction with our measures of echo chambers, we actually have found that in general, uh, there's some kind of standard patterns that are starting to emerge. For example, these are climate change believers and deniers. And what we see that climate change uh, deniers in general um, have, are much more echo chambery than are climate change believers. There's much higher level of reciprocity, even though they're a much smaller, smaller group. If we look at in terms of the structure, what we find is that in the, in the denier group, they tend to engage in building and bridging and dismay and distort tactics, whereas in the um, believers, they tend to engage in different kinds of tactics, such as engaging, explaining, bridging, and so on. Now, in the believer side, it's very amorphous. People are just sending out messages, usually explaining what's going on, why you sh should believe in, in, uh, in things. Explanation's very boring. It doesn't get reset back out a lot. And it's just kind of an all kind of all talking to all kind of thing. In contrast, on the denier side, it's very, very structured. And that is actually a very strong organizational structure that has different pockets that will pick up the information, spread it to a different pocket, and spread it to another. That is very easy to infiltrate as a company and to plan out a strategy for when you get disinformation to go to which, because it is already has a strong structure. This kind of strong structure with very dense pockets uh, and more echo chambers and lots of echo chambers within it is characteristic of many conservative groups and, is, and of many, conser in many countries that they'll have that kind of an organizational structure, whether that was there by nature or whether that was caused by third parties coming in and causing it to be that way, 
We don't know, but it, but it actually allows you to get out this kind of information. We also find that the pockets in the case of climate change ones are actually connected to other conspiracy theories and that all the conspiracy theories out there on social media are connected and that individuals who are members of two, three, four, three or more are like lost and you are never gonna get them to believe that those conspiracy theories are not will. But if they're on only one, you can actually pull them out. Um, Philippines, it's, it works a little bit differently. In the Indo-Pacific area, it's not really bots are not really controlling this. Whereas back here, you know, maybe 30 to 50 percent of the actors are actual bots. In the case of the Philippines, there's relatively few bots. The same with Indonesia. What's going on there is that instead, you see China's influence coming into play through having bought particular accounts and playing out through the use of trolls. Again, on the conservative pro-Chinese side, in both the uh, Indonesia and the Philippines elections, those sides are more echo chambery, um, and that they tend to have more, tr uh, more people attacking, more people in them who are going to the other side and acting as trolls. In the, in the side that is more anti-China, what you see is a greater use of dismay campaigns, but you also see these troll-like behavior, which you see through uh, increased use of, uh, of expletives, increased use of, of abusive terms, and increased use of disruptive behavior. Okay, and of course, this has led in the Deep South to actual political activity. <clears throat> so let's go back to, to movies, because the movies are so cool. Okay, Captain Marvel. Okay, I told my group if it worked for Black Panther, it was going to work for Captain Marvel. Let's go and study this movie again. Now, keep in mind that most of the people in my group are these young guys, and they thought I was nuts. They said, come on, this is just going to be a chick flick. There's not going to be any disinformation around it. And I was like, guys, this is the U.S. There is going to be disinformation. So we did the same thing again for, for this group. And what we, in fact, found were several different disinformation campaigns. The interesting pair of campaigns here were those associated with boycotting the movie. Uh, basically, they took a line by Brie Anderson that had nothing, that basically was reinterpreted to mean that she didn't want white men to go to the movie. Okay, that's not what she said at all, but it was interpreted that. And it's like, well, she doesn't want us to go, we're just going to boycott it. So one of the disinformation campaigns focused on boycott the movie. The other one was take the Alita challenge. Both of them began with, you know, she doesn't want us at the movie. But they had two very different responses in what they were messaging. If we look at the data over time, the boycott the movie one gets very little play. And it kind of comes up here and it has very, you know, just, just doesn't really happen. The Alita Challenge, much more play, much, much longer half-life, and has more impact. What we also found is that the Alita Challenge one was also picked up by celebrities and by news agencies. In this case, if you can, as part of your influence campaign, pose it in a positive light, link it to, in fact, uh, get it rebroadcast by news agencies who are thought to be reputable, and by celebrities who are for right or wrong in the United States are viewed as reputable, uh, you can actually get your influence campaign to spread farther, last longer, and so on. We've seen this happen again in other countries, um, again with their, with their local celebrities, whoever it was, being influential in this particular way. So again, the Ben maneuvers help us discover this kind of difference. So this whole area of social cybersecurity is really exciting. I have not gone into all the math and stuff behind this. We're using network science, uh, high dimensional networks that over time networks, metrics combined with machine learning and natural language processing to do all the things you've seen here. There's a lot of challenges in this area, largely dealing around with the data and the way the data providers are controlling access to it is leading to a whole new series of research that needs to be done in the area. This is all outlined in the decadal survey by the, by the National Academies. And it's why we at CMU started the new Center for Ideas for Informed Democracy and Social <coughs> Cybersecurity. That'll open it up for questions. No questions. Yes? When you think about some of the motivations behind these things, you can imagine state actors or political groups trying to sow discord. But when it comes to attacking you know, Captain Marvel, for example, 
what are, your, what are the speculations on motivations behind something of that nature? So in that particular case, <clears throat> there's actually a group of uh, people out there who really do not like Marvel or Disney and are anti, I mean, that's their motives to try to, and they will, they do this around every Disney and Marvel movie. So that's part of the group. It's also a competitive tactic between companies to try to downplay the other company. So we see that happening among lawyers, uh, disinformation campaigns about different lawyer groups. So it's also used there. And in the case of drugs um, and medicines, like there's a whole bunch of these around, steroids and opioids. Uh, in part, that is to cap, that is actually one to spread their, their medicine, their health product, whatever it is, but also to discredit the medical establishment. So lots of different motivations. Yes? Do you notice that if the mechanisms vary by like sort of social groupings, like are they different between, let's say, majority black groups, majority white groups, so LGBTQ groups, like how do these things sort of change or don't change when we're talking about different subpopulations? So we don't know. Um, we do know that there are variants across countries, largely due to the extent to which the country has adopted social media that lets them easily embed images or not. And also there's ones around the extent to which the culture is a storytelling culture or not. So we've seen that differences. As to whether within the same country there's differences based on ethnic minority or religious minority, we don't know. However, we have a proposal out to work with Howard and ASU because they'll bring in the Hispanic and, and uh, Native Americans to actually look at that exact issue. So we may know more in a year, hopefully. Yeah. Yes. Are there, uh, is there much work going on in the area of measuring influence? Uh, in the yeah. So, well, a lot of there's so the vanity metrics. There's that's where people started, and there's lots of measures of those. And then they went to measuring influence across multiple media, and then the new stuff has been trying to get out of that to measure things like uh, hysteria and polarization, and that's where the field is right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> sort of. Um, we have, we mostly we've done natural experiments, which is in this area pretty easy to do, such as using the Swedish elections. But we thought of actually trying to run experiments in the social media themselves, but decided that wasn't particularly ethical, so we weren't going to do it. However, we're, uh, several of the companies that we've talked to actually have, are convinced that's what they're going to propose to Facebook and Twitter to do. So Facebook runs a lot of its own experiments also in this space, and then we capture the data on it. Yeah. Yes? So towards the question about quantitative impact, um, has anybody looked at maybe measuring if when people talk bad about a company, if the stock price drops, or when it's about a movie, if there's less tickets sold, or, or anything like that? Um, yeah, there was one study on stock markets, and there was some impact. It's very difficult to do because most people are not capturing the data right. in a way that's easy, in a way that is getting the full, the full thing, because most people are capturing it using um, keywords. And so by the time they get the data, it's just, first off, it's only a sample, and they don't know how biased it is. So unbiasing the data is the huge issue there. But people are, are starting to try to do that. Okay. So. Which is why we were so happy with the cyber attack one, because that was one of the first big ones <laughs> like that. Yeah? Uh, on what? Uh, what are the ideas for like, countermeasures and policies? And okay. So countermeasures, there's actually, um, a, so right now people are just kind of saying, I found this thing that worked in the, in the field as a countermeasure. And so we're beginning to get a list of what those might be. But the idea, the plan is across the larger community is to build up a simulation environment uh, where you can go in and try out different countermeasures to see what their relative effectiveness is. So that's kind of the current plan. Yes? Are there any efforts to educate the public about this? There's a ton of efforts. Um, so at, in ideas, our plan will be more working with to do education to uh, journalists and policymakers. But at a couple of the other groups, their thing is going out to uh, K, th K through 12. 
and the uh, social cybersecurity webpage that we now maintain actually has pointers to various educational material as well as other resources in this area. So yeah. Yes. Do you know Twitter so So um, I don't know their exact algorithms. They do have a bunch of people inside who study it, and they have their own people inside who find bots and so on. But it is in their interest not to uh, get rid of all bots because a lot of them are used for good reasons uh, and are used for marketing, and it's one of the ways they make money. So it's kind of a complex kind of thing. But the trouble with a lot of the social media companies is they don't publish their research. They don't go to conferences, so people... There may be, they may have no lot of things we don't know that we, you know, that people are trying to find out, but we won't know. Yeah. yeah. Just to chime in off that. I think off of Twitter's last year's financial disclosure, they reported 24% of their traffic was bot generated. Yeah. Yeah. But keeping fit, that's not uniform. So it'll be higher around political campaigns, and then there'll be ones around. Um, around different advertising subgroups. So like there's one around for the Dallas cheerleaders, for example. Let's thank our speaker.